Well, good evening, active traders, and welcome to our special event tonight, Options Indicators and Breakouts with uh, my longtime colleague Larry McMillan and myself, Ken Calhoun, coming at you live here on Thursday, December 6, 2018. Hey, Larry, it's great to have you here tonight. Oh, thanks, Ken. Good to, good to talk to you again. Yeah, so Larry will go the first half hour, and then I'll pick up the second half hour. Let me quickly introduce Larry and then turn it over to him. Uh, professional trader Larry McMillan's the author of Options is a Strategic Investment. He literally wrote the book on options, and it's a bestseller that sold over 300,000, probably more by now, but over 300,000 copies. He's received the CBOE Sullivan Award as well as been inducted into the Traders Hall of Fame. Larry's been featured all over the place, multiple publications and events throughout the country and Europe. Uh, Larry and I first became colleagues presenting at some of the live money show, Traders Expo money show events in uh, Vegas and New York and so forth. So uh, anyway, uh, great to have you here. Let me let, Larry, let me turn this over to you. It's a quick disclaimer. Okay. As always, all information is for educational use only. So let me turn it over to you, and I look forward to seeing what you got to say. It's been it's been a while since we've right. done this. Sounds good. That's a, it'll, it'll, okay. it'll tell me to uh, view my screen or something like that. Yep. You just did okay. that, so you should see the. There we go. All right. <clears throat> Can you see that? Yeah, looks good. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, we're going to spend the next half hour going over some of the uh, option-oriented indicators and other things that we look at uh, in terms of, uh, well, exactly, predicting the market uh, in this particular case. Um, <clears throat> just a brief bit of background. Our, our company is divided into three parts. We have a money management part. We're both a CTA and an RIA. We run a one basic strategy for about uh, uh, managing about 80 million in that strategy. Uh, we also uh, still do our derivatives research. That's what we started out this company as 28 years ago as a research firm. So we publish newsletters such as the Daily Strategist and uh, the Option Strategist. Then we also do a certain amount of option education uh, seminars like this, but more specifically, uh, uh, we have a mentoring as well. <clears throat> um, you're going to be receiving the PDF uh, of this uh, webinar, the recording of it, I guess, and, uh, and I also uh, the PDF. So um, you won't really need to spend your time doing that. But if you do want to go to our website here, optionstrategist.com forward slash Calhoun, uh, there are some uh, special offers on a few of our newsletters, and you could use the uh, coupon code Calhoun there to uh, attain those offers. Uh, again, that would be in an email you'll get uh, from us, and so you don't have to madly write all that down. All right, well, let's get started. Um, <clears throat> this is a very interesting market, uh, high volatility, a lot of back and forth action, and uh, uh, there's four main things that we look at. The first and foremost is the chart of the S&P 500 itself. Uh, we also look at equity-only put call ratios. Uh, we look at market breadth uh, with a slight option slant to that, and then we pay attention to the volatility indexes, uh, primary VIX, primarily VIX. But uh, I will also be talking about a few other things at the end, uh, just to kind of put it all together. <clears throat> Uh, one important rule uh, is that oversold does not mean buy. So when we have markets collapsing uh, like they did in the last couple of days or earlier in October or last February, the market gets oversold. But we uh, always recommend waiting for confirmed buy signals before buying. So uh, our indicators, the things we're looking at, we're usually looking to be in a trade for a few days or maybe in a few weeks, whereas Ken is a shorter time period in his uh, outlook. Um, and the corollary to that, of course, is overbought does not mean uh, you should sell. Either you wait for confirmed signals. We don't have anything right now that's overbought. <clears throat> so uh, here's the current chart of the S&P 500. And I've tried to simplify it a little bit. I've taken out a lot of the things. So there's just a couple of things on here. First of all, what really stands out to me is this resistance up here at 2,800. Uh, we failed the first time in early October. Rallied all the way back, failed the second time in November, and then last week rallied back to 2,800 and failed roughly in the same area again. So this this is heavy uh, resistance. Um, if we were to break out above there and have expanding volume, 
uh, uh, expanding breadth, then I would say uh, the Bulls would be back in charge. Until then, uh, in my opinion, the Bears are in charge. So we've come down here. We tested the 2,600 level there. You can see last spring we were heavily uh, testing around the 2,580 to 2,620 level. Uh, again, uh, today we tested the 26 level. So this is certainly support. And if we break through here, then the lows of February would come into play at 2530. And typically that's when uh, in a bear market, if you break that first moves low, when the first move of this bear market was what happened in February, if you break that low, then volatility explodes at that point. Uh, so far, volatility really hasn't exploded. It's risen but it hasn't exploded. So uh, we'll talk more about that later. This line right here is the 200-day uh, moving average. And uh, you can see that early in the year, it was providing support three times, one, two, three, bounced off of there and rallied. Now it's resistance. Uh, and this is also what happens when you transition into a bear market. You typically have uh, lower highs, one, two, three, and you keep, falling back below the 200-day moving average. Um, <clears throat> today, obviously, we had, I've drawn today's action on here. That's the last bar. We had a, a very strong reversal rally. But again, reversal rallies are, are common in bear markets. There's an old saying that no one makes money in a bear market because the shorts get shaken out of their shorts on these big rallies, and yet the longs get mashed on, on the ongoing trend. So we'll see. I mean, there is some argument that right now we're just really in this crazy trading range between 26.20 and 28.20. Um, I don't really believe that we're going to stay in such a trading range for long, but it's certainly not, uh, you know, it's certainly possible that you could see that, see this chart and say that it's, it's just a wild trading range. It's certainly wild, that's for sure. So just to summarize on this chart, uh, we have lower highs. Uh, we have the, the first two lower lows. Uh, we have this major support at 2580 to 2620, and then below that, 2530. The heavy resistance at 2800, 2820, and the trend lines are negative too. I'm trying to keep that chart a little bit cleaner. It didn't have too many trend lines on there, but we follow a system of modified Bollinger Bands, and they are sloping downwards as well right now. So overall, this is a bearish chart uh, unless SPX can break out, unless the S&P 500 can break out about 2820. <clears throat> So uh, let's move to the next thing, put call ratios. Uh, these are very interesting in, in that they measure people's opinions, supposedly. And um, they were invented by, first invented by Marty Zweig back in the 1950s when he was taking the volume of puts and calls out of the ads in Barron's on Sundays. The various put call brokers would run ads showing the volume they did during the week. Um, so it's a contrary indicator. If too many people are buying puts, then that means everybody's loading up on the bearish side and we want to do something bullish. Conversely, if too many people are buying calls, then everybody's loading up on the bullish side and we'd want to do something bearish. So we'll try to quantify what too much uh, means. Uh, simplistically, here's an example. I suppose we just take IBM. At the end of the day, we sum up the volume of all the puts that were traded in IBM. And separately, we sum up the volume of all the calls that were traded in IBM, and we divide the two, and that's the put call ratio. Uh, Marty Zweig put, puts in the, new, in the uh, numerator of the fraction, so heavy put buying in a bear market, let's say, makes the ratio go higher. Conversely, since calls are in the denominator, heavy call buying, say in a bull market, makes the ratio go lower. So the put call ratio actually moves in the opposite direction to the stock itself. Uh, we keep a moving average 21 days, just in case you like Fibonacci numbers. And uh, typically, we would have something like this with the stock on top, the put call ratio on the bottom, and they should have this inverse pattern. So as the stock is bottoming out, the put call ratio is peaking. Or conversely, as the stock is topping out, the put call ratio is making a, a, a low. So... Um, if you look at, we post about 400 and some put call ratio charts on our website every day in an area that we call the strategy zone. And if you uh, look at those, you look at a chart, it should have that symmetry. If it doesn't, then I would not use that put call ratio chart for trading. 
Uh, there are some times when arbitrage or other things will distort these. But here's the S&P 500. Now, this is not a current chart, but on, on the top is the S&P 500. On the bottom is the equity-only put call ratio. And I just want to show you that they have this inverse symmetry. So we do use these equity-only put call ratios uh, as the um, put call ratio for predicting the broad stock market. And by equity only, we mean all stock options that trade. So here's the current chart going back about a year. And the one thing that's very significant here, as you can see, it, it made a relative low in uh, right around the beginning of October. So that's a sell signal for the stock market. And we certainly got that. And now about a week ago or so, they made a relative high and it's curling back over like this and that's a buy signal. So this indicator is on a buy signal right now and it's coming from a very extreme height. Uh, it's coming from around 85. What 85 here means that 85 uh, uh, puts are traded for every 100 calls, which in terms of stock options would be quite bearish, quite I mean, everyone else is quite bearish, so obviously we want to be bullish. Um, <clears throat> you can see the various buys and sells over, throughout the year. Some of them, when they come from the extremes, are, are better, like this one. Say, when they come in the middle, sometimes they're not so great. But this this one is coming from an extreme, so you know it has a chance to be a, a good buy signal. The <clears throat> as the in, as computers have become more prevalent, of course, we can do better calculations, and we can calculate the weighted put call ratio. So what we do here is we calculate how many dollars are being spent on the option. In other words, at the end of the day, we take the options price and multiply it by the volume of that day. Now you could do each trade along the day, along the way each day, but we just do it this way. At the end of the day, we calculate that. So let's say for all the IBM options. And again, we sum those dollar volume totals up for the puts. Separately, we sum them up for the calls and we divide the two. So now we're measuring the dollars being spent on bearish opinion versus the dollars being spent on bullish opinion. And it does give better signals, in my opinion. Uh, what we've done here, you can see that we actually had kind of a uh, came up, made the high. So that's a buy signal. Then it, it sort of retreated and gave a second one. And now it just started to back off again. Uh, this does not include today's data, just yesterday's. But this general area also. Uh, is a is a buy signal in here, and will should be you know lasting until the ratio uh, comes on down. Now there have been cases where the market really doesn't do too much, like say here, but the ratio will, will drop substantially as the people's attitude uh, wants them to chase the market and they start buying calls heavily instead of buying puts. They were buying puts, of course, in this uh, time period. So uh, just to sum here, both of these equity only put call ratios, uh, regular and the way it gave great sell signals in late September. Now they've generated buy signals. Um, I'm not jumping in on with both feet on these because the SPX chart is not bullish, but uh, if they got in sync, that would be uh, much better. Uh, the fact that these buy signals on the put call ratios are coming from very high levels on their chart means they came from an extreme oversold condition and that should be uh, good as well. So overall, this indicator is bullish. Um, I just want to mention one other one, the total put call ratio. Right now, it's not giving a signal, but it just did give one. And, and when it, it gives a signal, it only gives buy signals, and they're worth 100 points in SPX. We just had a 117-point rise after the last signal was about five days. So you see, we can have a put call ratio buy signal and still be in an overall bearish trend. <clears throat> Uh, you know, we, we keep track of these, of course, in our newsletters that come out every day, and uh, subscribers are kept abreast of these when these signals occur. Um, the next thing we look at is market breadth. So breadth is uh, just advances, minus declines. We keep a cumulative total as well as an oscillator. And the oscillator is calculated this way. We take 90% of uh, yesterday's oscillator value and add to it 10% of today's advances, minus declines. We actually calculate this in, in two ways. Uh, one, we use regular uh, New York Stock Exchange advances and declines. But the problem there is that they they do they have things that are not really stocks, and they, they have some other things that wandering around in there, like preferreds or what have you. So we also uh, calculate a stocks only oscillator, and this uses uh, only stocks. And what stocks do we use? Well, we use stocks that have options traded on them. 
because there's a pretty big set of those, almost uh, 6,000 of those. So we can have a really uh, robust uh, sample of advances and declines. So here's the stocks only oscillator. Uh, currently, well, actually going back to like 2013 here on the far end of the chart. And so when it reaches red area, it's overbought. When it reaches the green area, the heavily minus, it's oversold. And just because, remember I said earlier, just because you're overbought doesn't mean sell. So here it entered an overbought state, but didn't come out of it till over here. So you can see the market went up heavily during that time period, then, then ran into a little trouble. So uh, we only indicate these uh, signals when they come back out of the area. So we just here uh, two days ago, or yesterday, sorry, got a new sell signal from Breadth. Uh, it, it rallied up uh, on that last big rally we had last week where Chairman Powell, Fed Chairman Powell said positive things. Actually, I thought he said neutral things, but the market interpreted them as positive things. And then also uh, President Trump and President Xi of China, Z, whatever, uh, you know, had their meeting and again, didn't say too much, but basically the market interpreted bullishly, at least for a while. That forced this oscillator up here into overbought territory and then came right back out giving a, a sell signal. You can see that we've been down here in oversold territory and gave buy signals a couple of times uh, here recently and those worked out okay. Right now, we're kind of in the middle, moving between a sell signal down perhaps towards another buy signal uh, soon. So uh, just to summarize, these oscillators are on sell signals. Uh, they're very short term, uh, these oscillator signals, and they flip quickly. That's been an advantage here in 2018, where we've had a lot of fast moving markets back in February, March, and April, and again here in October, November, December. And so uh, we do pay uh, close attention to this. Uh, what, do, what are we really looking for? Well, what we'd really like to see is, and you know, if it's going to be a change of trend, is uh, if SPX does break out above that 2820, which hasn't happened yet, we'd want to see these oscillators get very overbought and expand very heavily, and that would drive, you know, the market could drive higher while that's happening. None of that has happened, but you know, in a in a perfect world, when you got that on the upside uh, breakout, you'd have expanding growth. That could be a long ways off though before that happens. So the fourth thing we look at is VIX and uh, volatility in general. Um, the first thing with VIX that we pay attention to is the trend of VIX. So if the VIX chart is trending higher, that's uh, bearish for stocks. Uh, VIX tends to move in the opposite direction of the stock market. Um, you know, not every single day, every single minute, but in general, it moves the opposite way. Uh, there's also uh, an indicator that we use with spike peak buy signals on VIX, where VIX spikes up and then spikes back down again, and that gives a buy signal for the stock market. We'll take a look at some of those. And then uh, finally, uh, a low VIX is overbought. We haven't had that now, of course, but we did uh, this summer and, of course, throughout most of 2017. As long as VIX is staying low, stocks can continue to rise. The trouble happens. When VIX breaks out from a low area and starts to quickly rise higher, then that's bad for stocks. <clears throat> so here's the current chart of VIX going back about a year. And uh, I've marked a bunch of Bs on there. Those are all VIX spike peak buy signals. So the red Bs have, were successful signals. We have a system built around this that we trade. The blue ones are unsuccessful, even though the market did briefly move higher in the, as I said, these are not day trading things. We're supposed to be in these for, you know, one to three weeks or so. And so uh, we have had a series now of overlapping ones. That in theory, the signal lasts for 22 days. So like this signal lasted for 22 days and then expired. 22 days is about a month, 22 trading days. But you can see here we had one before that one expired, another buy, then another buy, and now just today, a buy. Today, VIX traded all the way up to nearly 26 and closed at 21, and that is a new spike peak buy signal uh, here for stocks. So again, we could have a run, a short run towards the upside, um, and you know, in, in a bear market, the, the, the bear will try to confuse you as much as possible with conflicting signals. So we're quite aware that uh, we're not going to throw all our eggs in one basket because of a new buy signal here, but we will trade this in the short term 
while still maintaining an intermediate term uh, bearish uh, outlook on the stock market. Now you can see that VIX is basically trending higher still, whether you consider it that one or maybe this one, whatever. But if it got down here below 16, I'm going to erase that because it just really didn't come out too well. Uh, if it got, gets drops down here below 16, then I would consider that VIX was no longer in an uptrend and that would be bullish for stocks. So this 16 level here on VIX is somewhat akin to the 2820 level on SPX. So if VIX were to break below 16 and SPX broke out above 2820, that would be pretty bullish in my opinion. It hasn't happened yet. I don't really expect it to, but you know we're, we're not in the business of being stubbornly uh, against the market, I will go uh, with you know whatever the market is showing me. So uh, just to summarize here, VIX is trending higher. That's that's bearish for the intermediate term. Um, the close below 16 would terminate that uptrend, and that therefore would be bullish. Uh, so, but right now that hasn't happened. So overall, the trend of VIX is bearish. But now we just and I just added this into the slide because it happened today. Uh, we get this new VIX spike peak buy signal that was confirmed today. And so uh, we are buying some calls uh, based on that. Uh, as I said, well, still looking for uh, the market to move lower later. Um, <clears throat> there's another thing that we watch, and that's the relationship of the VIX, various VIX products to each other. Uh, I call the entire pattern here the VIX construct. So the first thing we look at is, are the VIX futures trading at a premium or a discount to VIX? In other words, are they trading higher than the price of VIX or lower? If they're trading lower, that's bearish. So they are right now trading lower than the price of VIX, even at the close today, and that's uh, bearish. Furthermore, we look at the various uh, indices. So in futures, you know, we, we have the uh, the December futures and then the January futures and then February, et cetera. If we look at the prices of these, they're kind of flat to slightly down. That's also bearish. In a bull market, they would slope upwards like this. And then finally, the CBOE volatility indices, there are actually five of them the CBOE publishes, uh, ranging from a short-term nine-day to the VIX, which is a 30-day, all the way out to one year. And right now, those are inverted as well, which is uh, a bit surprising on the close. But for example, the nine-day uh, volatility index for the CBO is trading at 25. The 30-day, which is VIX, is trading at 21. And the one-year is trading at 20.5. So you can see they're sloping downwards. That's bearish. So we don't really have time for me to go into why that's bearish, but you can just take my word for it for right now. So putting all this volatility information together, uh, volatility is generally bearish for the market, right, for the stock market, because the construct is bearish and VIX is turning higher. However, this new VIX uh, spike peak buy signal does provide a little bit of a, a bullish uh, short-term outlook. So summarize what we've done so far. The SPX chart is still bearish or if, if you want to say it's in a trading, a wild trading range, I guess you could say that, but that's, it's still not bullish uh, unless it breaks out to the upside. Put cut ratios are positive uh, and, and they're coming out of an oversold condition, so that should be good. Uh, but countering that, their breadth oscillators are on sell signals now and they're still on sell signals at the end of today. Breadth was still negative at the, at the end of the day today. Uh, the VIX chart is bearish intermediate term, but bullish for that little bit short term on the VIX spike peak buy signal. And the term structure of volatility is bearish. So overall, this this is bearish. I'm considering we're actually in a bear market. One of the things that really you know, points out to me that we're in a bear market is the ferocity of these rallies. In fact, we did some studies. I don't have a chart on this. We did some studies. And remember last week, and when Chairman... Fed Chairman Powell spoke, the market was up 61 points that day, closed up 61 S&P points. That was like the seventh biggest gain, daily gain of all time. We went back and looked of the top 11 largest daily gains in S&P 500, 
every single one it was reversed within uh, roughly a week and this one was also reversed within a week by closing by trading down below 2685 today it wiped out that entire rally of last week when that kind of action happens that's not a bull market it's a bear market and so typically bear markets take out the october lows in late november or early december i think we might still have a shot at doing that uh you know we we're so carried away the day by the time we got to the lows the market was pretty oversold um but we'll see you know if if it does that certainly uh and in my mind you know confirms that we're in a bear market uh, just a couple of other things. There's some negative divergences that have, have been very useful to us this year. Uh, they signaled the February and October declines, especially the October one. And the two that stand out the most is looking at new highs versus new lows and looking at the chart of the Russell 2000 uh, or the IWM, if you prefer, which is the ETF. Uh, here's new highs versus new lows, very simplistically, but we look at it in three different ways. Uh, so first we look at new highs and new lows using New York Stock Exchange data. Uh, we also look at it using um, stocks only data. Remember I told you about the stocks only data. And then uh, up, up on top of is the chart of the S&P 500. So let me just point to you back here in February. You can see zero would be an equal number of new highs and new lows. So new lows started to dominate new highs really before we fell here, before we had that big decline. Same thing happened again here in, in late September. New highs started to dominate new lows while the market was still up here. So those are great warning signs. What's occurred since then inside this red square or rectangle is uh, quite amazing to me that new lows have continued to dominate new highs. Even last week on that 61 point update, there were more uh, new lows than new highs. So, you know, they just about got back to even, but didn't quite make it. And now we've fallen off uh, sharply again. This kind of action is telling you that underneath the market, underneath this S&P 500, which you know, everyone on TV loves so much. You know, there's a lot more deterioration going on than you might think. And when new lows dominate new highs for this long, that that's not a symptom of a correction. This was a symptom of a correction here. It just lasted a couple of weeks and then maybe a couple, a little bit more, but then it took off to the upside and mostly new highs uh, were, were dominating new lows again. When you get this kind of long weeks at a time where new lows are, are, are dominating new highs uh, that's that's a market that's got more serious problems and uh, the divergence so that was one of the divergences here's the other one the uh, Russell 2000 in September and I don't have the S&P chart here but it was at the beginning we were still rallying S&P was rallying up like this to where it was um, you know making new highs but the Russell 2000 started to fall off and then fell off badly. And now you can see here, here's the 200 day moving average of the Russell 2000. It hasn't even come back towards that. And meanwhile, there's clear, clearly a pattern of lower highs and lower lows, including today reaching another new low, even though it did rally back. That is a very bearish chart. And that is uh, what's really happening in stocks. And the S&P 500, of course, being a smaller subset of stocks, uh, is right now acting better. But typically, we'll catch up to that uh, on the downside. And then one, one final thing that I want to mention, and we'll turn this back over to Ken. I have one minute left. Uh, there is a seasonal bullishness to the end of the trading year. There are actually three patterns that exist. One is a post-Thanksgiving rally that typically begins on the Wednesday before Thanksgiving and runs into December. Then that transfers itself into what used to be called the January effect. Well, I guess it might still be called the January effect, but it happens in December now where small caps start to outperform big caps. That has not happened yet. I just showed you the small cap chart. And then finally, the very end of the year, the last five days, trading days of one year, plus the first two trading days of the next year of the Santa Claus rally is defined by Yale Hirsch. So if you put these all together in some years, you kind of get this steady advancement through 
uh, into December, into the new year, and uh, IWM outperforms, et cetera. In bear markets, it's much choppier. But we did certainly have this. We, we had that huge rally right after Thanksgiving. Uh, we haven't had either of these two yet. But I do still expect some year-end uh, seasonal bullishness whether you want to call it window dressing or whatever. So we are looking for a, a rally later in the year, but uh, late in this year. Uh, but I'm still wondering and thinking that maybe these October lows are taken out first. Uh, in in uh, a couple of the years, the actual uh, low for December wasn't made until like 1221 or 1218. You know, it's much later in the month than we are now. Anyways, uh, that's what I have. Don't forget to uh, visit our website if you're interested in some of the uh, specials we have going right now. Our track record has been very good in uh, our newsletters as far as calling this market and saying, I'm, you know, both buy and sell signals staying on the right side of things. And you will be receiving, um, uh, Ken will be sending you the recording and uh, I believe we'll be sending you uh, the PDF of this webinar as well. All right, Ken, let me turn it back over to you. I'm, I'm showing 731. Sorry, I went over one. No, it's uh, no, absolutely brilliant. I really liked your coverage of the put call ratio, the oscillator, uh, looking at the Russell as a lead indicator is correct. And, of course, I love trading the VIX ETN. So really smart analysis. Thanks so much. I, was, I, really, I always learn so much more from you than uh, any of these other folks out there, like the talking heads will never be this <laughs> intelligent in their commentary. They're all like, Buy the dips and yeah. Right. Or they want to tell you what they bought yesterday that's up today. <laughs> right, right. Hindsight's wonderful, but for those of us who don't have time machines, we gotta actually learn the mechanics. So thanks so much. It's really brilliant too. It's it's an honor working with you, man. You're one of the best in the whole industry. And I like the, All right, Ken. I, I like learning work with from you, the the VIX too. So all right, well let's get underway with uh, my portion. We're gonna look at a number of different things. One thing that I'm gonna cover for the first time in history is looking at some advanced strategies for options trading using our using Apple and looking at some of the different strikes for the weeklies. I'm not patient enough to do monthly, so in our current market cycles up and down in one and a half week increments, right? So we're going to take a look at some options trading strategies coming up later. Um, let me give you, give you all a quick introduction so you know who the heck I am. If you haven't heard of me, I'm president of the original Day Trading University, now Trade Mastery. I'm a money show speaker. I did 500 trades. I was really busy in October, and I did even more than that in uh, in November. So I've done over a thousand trades in the last two months alone. So I'm a busy guy. I've done as much as 4.9 million in actual trades in a single year. That's my record. So you may have seen me all over the place. I, I'm in every month's uh, issue of Stocks and Commodities. It's great to be published there every month in the Trading on Momentum column for the last several years now. So you may have seen me in market watch and blah, blah, blah. Let's get on with it. Let's take a look at our market. Here's the S&P on the 90-day. And what you notice is failed rallies each time, right? That's why I shorted the market by going long in my favorite instrument, TVIX, on Wednesday. And I banked a near $1,400 profit on that. I was day trading this. Speaking of the VIX, let's take a look at the TVIX instrument. And let me show you. I'm a big fan of proof. So I, I scaled in only a few hundred shares total, and I sold as my best day trade of my entire 20-year career. I sold 45.24. And of course, in hindsight, I wish I'd let the 300 ride. I'd be up another couple grand. But uh, anyway, that's a it's a lot of fun. Here's my Twitter feed, and you can see my trade confirmation here. I sold 250 shares of TVIX. I got a fill at 45 and a quarter on the fourth, which was day before yesterday, 11 grand worth of stocks. And to me, I think that was a pretty good exit because of the accuracy. And that was probably the most thrilling day trade I've made in my life in 20 years because I sold, let me point that out on this, right there. If I could draw the trend line, draw the line, Ken. Right above that, right near there. So it was one of the most thrilling day trades of my life. I, I was in 150. I doubled down and did another 150 on the way up to scale in. I sold 250 there and then the remaining 50 at 44.40. Uh, and so that was a good round trip day trade. I like trading instruments like this, TVIX, because they're volatility. And uh, they're, they're more, more for intraday trading than for swings. 
But anyway, that's just me on VIX. It's my favorite instrument to day trade because of the range and the volatility. I'm doing a hedge where I'm also trading it against the long instruments like T triple Qs and TNA and so forth. But let's take a look at some strategy points for options trading because I think one of the things that you want to focus on when it comes to directional volatility, you want to find charts that are easy to to be in the money on relatively consistently, whether you're shorting oil with instruments like SCO or my favorite way to short the oil market is DWT. Now I'm starting, I put on a trade for overnight today in UWT because it is a, a bounce play, right? It had gone from 50 all the way down to 14. My two favorite potential pivot plays in the entire stock market are not Apple. I like things with more leverage. So UWT is one. DGAS is quite a bit more risky, but the upside potential is big, right? It's been trading around 55.60 the last couple of weeks in consolidation. I like the fact that we've got a high volume consolidation. I want to see if I can scale in and trade this guy between the 80 and 180. So, but anyway, as a, as a directional options trader, or if you're trading stra straddles or strangles or trying to do sideways trading in a sideways market, you want to start by focusing on the very strongest patterns out there, the ones that are easier to trade. Always pick on the easy charts, right? Make make life easy on yourself. As Larry noted quite brilliantly too, uh, we're we're testing support. 2600 is the big picture. This is a 90-day chart. I'm not going to do the one year. Everybody's talking about the death cross here, but the reason why I shorted this, and I've been going long in the Here's what the TVIX looks like, right? I used to trade VXX dominantly, but TVIX has better leverage. So look at the range in this, the profit potential from 26 to 60, then back down. And it's cycling in between the 100 and 200 SMA lines. Okay. If you look at some of these ETFs, one thing that, and Larry's right, you always want to be looking for lead indicators and in the small caps. So. If we can find our small cap bear, that's what's known as a golden cross. That's when the 50 SMA trades to the upside over the 200. That's a long signal, and that's in our bearish small cap, right? So that's kind of like shorting the Russell. This told you the signal way back on November 19th, you know, several weeks ago. And as an active trader, you're looking for opportunities to trade these things the right way. If you look at TNA, on the other hand, the bullish version of that, does everybody see this death cross? How many of you spotted this? You get extra gold stars and bonus points as a professional trader. If you, like I, spotted the death cross, that's a sell signal, and the 50 breaks the 200. Uh, we got a death cross in the Russell, effectively, November 12th, okay? And that was a full month ago well, three weeks ago, uh, we saw weakness in the small cap. So that's a death cross. You know, all the talking heads, of course, they're pretty stupid. So what, you know what they're, I mean, I shouldn't say that. They're entertaining. So they do have some value in the world, arguably. But they're, they're talking about the S&P death cross today, you know, and that's all well and fine. But professionals are prepared. Like my colleague Brian Tracy says, Pre preparation's all mark of a professional. I was prepared to, I started shorting the market back here in the loss of the 100 SMA, but recently on the new cycle, I always sell the rallies. That's what I call a, a bullish trap market. So we always fade the rallies. In a bear market, you always do that. You sell you know, lower, lower lows and lower highs. So we took out a new low down here. Anyway, that's the death cross, and that was in the Russell. Now, that's extremely valuable information that nobody else in the entire world I've seen, including any educator talking had talked about that was the big sell signal for the market, right? And you could have made a bundle like I did going long in TVIX. I used to trade VXX mostly, but TVIX has better intraday point range uh, on its golden cross, right? And it's back, back in play now. So anyways, you're looking for trade setups. The point is make sure that you're looking for volatility. And if you're doing your directional options trades, do try and focus folks on things that are relatively consistent. Okay, now I think we are oversold in oil now, so I'm starting to hedge by purchasing UWT. I used to trade USO and UCO as my dominant, and OIH for that matter, the oil holders, as my dominant 
long. And I was long these guys for long-term swing, and I sold into the drop here, which is good. Then I sat out this whole way down. Now I'm looking for a bounce and a rally, and I'm looking for the instrument with the best point range. One of the quick tips that I want to give you, whether you're trading the underline or you're trading your directionals, is make sure that you give focus on instruments that have the biggest point range as possible. So, for example, things that double on a 90-day chart are really good. You're not going to see that kind of volatility or that point range in something like Apple, right? But this went 13 to 26, so it's a doubler for shorting crude, right? Now we may see the opposite in UWT, which had been... And I expect to make a lot of money trading the bounce in crude if and when it occurs. Uh, not a trading signal, because I'm not a... because. Unlike some people, I'm not an RIA. I'm just a guy who trades millions of dollars worth of stuff, knows how to trade. I'm waiting for a break well over, say, 1650 or so, and then I'll start putting on some size. And I want to build the trade at least a couple 3,000 shares on a pivot. And then the sell signal, or the sell target would be around 28, right, with that moving average. So that would be the pivot play in the bounce and crude. It may still be due for pain and suffering ahead, so I just put on a little baby trade, but... Uh, I always use I use position sizing and scaling religiously. It's the the saving grace as a trader. You may have seen my money show video on pilot trades. The CBOE, yeah, the Chicago floor traders call them feeler trades. One of my colleagues told me that. But anyway, I've been I like to document some of my real money trades on my Twitter feed. Now here's a quick point about the value of position sizing. I was only long 150 shares, little baby chicken scratch trade uh, on the way up here. And I was at that point, and this is day before yesterday, right? With real money trades, my fidelity. Anyway, so I was up 615. That beats a kick in the head, and that's that's good for surf and turf at a fancy restaurant somewhere. But I scaled in, and I doubled down on the trade. I added another 150 shares there, and I sold 45 and a quarter here for 1400 up. So that's the power and profit potential of position sizing or scaling. You know, if you get a great trade set up and you make it, that's one thing. But, you know, like if you're in your options trading, if you're doing, say, just a couple, three, four contracts at a time, uh, you may want to add to or subtract out of your number of contracts you're trading based on the relative strength of the, uh, the pattern as you're getting close to expiration. But anyway, look for that. So that's the power. I over doubled my profit because I had the the cojones to double down here. Now, did it look extended up there? Not to me. I'm a pro. When you have high volume breakouts and they continue up, yeah, it looked overbought to the novice, but I've been trading the VIX ETNs and ETS for years. I, I One of my most successful days was trading VXX on the flash crash day. And I even had a talk uh, with my colleague Steve Nesson later that day, and he was saying, quiet day in the market, huh? And we, don't know about that, but I, I sold uh, VXX near the exact pivot high using a shooting star on a five minute uh, during the flash crash. So I'm an expert in trading the VIX instruments. Anyway, let's get back to options. One, uh, So that's just a quick tip on Calhoun on VIX and options and what I've been doing lately. But that was my best, most thrilling day trade of my entire career. No BS. I mean, I'm original. I was day trading back in 1999, back when... Like Yahoo is 260 and all that back in the day. But that was my most thrilling day trade of the year. It, it looks a lot smaller here than it does on the one one day chart, where it's way up here. But anyway, trading this on the way up from it, look at the point range, 36 to 45. Big range. Big ranges are key to success as a trader. You got to trade volatility. Now let's take a look at our options chain for Apple. It's kind of cool, the Fidelity thing. I like the fact that they've got the instruments with the highest volume and open interest. Gives you this nice little blue background, kind of like a chart. It's a really nice little visual indicator. The problem is, and for those of you who also trade options, you know that oftentimes the strike with the highest volume and the highest open interest is not the best strike. Just because the, the, the crowd goes there, uh, oftentimes I found the more profitable strike is going to be just one on one side or the other. So that's Calhoun on options. A quick tip is, you know, if you're looking at, say, the 170, well, that's for tomorrow. So let's say a week out, let's say you're looking at the 170 put for a hit down there. The, the highest open interest is the 170, right? But you can get a price improvement at the 
or you have to pay a little bit up more for closer in the money on the 172.50 put. Okay, but one of the things you want to do as an options trader is make sure that you are testing things like, you know, what's not only the spread, the bid ask spread, but how much are you paying in premium to get into that position? And are you trading instruments that have the best, uh, you know, the best odds of working out? What I found the hard way, and I've been doing hundreds of test trades with the small size options trades over the last couple of years now, trying to get my strategy honed to a point where I can bring it public for everybody is it's a lot tougher than it looks. And options tend to be relatively efficient and fairly priced, especially in heavily traded instruments like Apple. So obviously you don't want to do newbie mistakes like play the lottery and go so far to the money, but it's only 44 cents. A, yeah, well, that's there's a reason why. Right. So you don't want to pay up. Obviously, you don't want to pay a premium. You don't want to play the lottery and go out. But neither do you want to play the, the most popular one, because often I won't say every time, but often that's not the right one would have been on one side or the other. So that's one quick tip. Another is make sure that you're making that you are trading the cycle test out. Always be a fan of testing. I did over a thousand real money trades during the two months recent October, and November, that might most two active months and years. Uh, because I'm constantly testing. And as a trader, you need to not just take things at face value, what you see on YouTube videos or, or what somebody is talking about. You need to test what your own personal risk tolerance, price action, and instrument choices that you can make the most money with the most often. So just because everyone's talking about Apple doesn't mean that's the right instrument or the spiders or whatever. You want to test out a variety of different instruments and see where you make the most money the most consistently. But one thing to pay keen attention to is the open interest. The volume is also, of course, important, but the open interest is the open interest and the spread are two of the things that I spend a lot of time testing out in terms of finding out which strike uh, makes sense in the options chain. So make sure that you're looking at that. Maybe you're better, you know, with the two week pattern that, you know, maybe you do better on uh, trading two weeks out rather than just one week out. And again, you don't have to hold till expiration, you can scale out ahead of time. So, one, one of the common mistakes that a lot of options traders that I've heard from over the years uh, make is that they over leverage. And one thing that I found that has done extremely well for me is play the field. So I'd much rather trade five different positions of two contracts each than one position of 10 contracts. I don't know how many of you agree with that, but I agree with the whole idea of uh, trade small, trade off. And I say trade wide, not deep. So I'd much rather do a couple of contracts and take a few shots than put it all my eggs in one basket. So make sure that you're diversifying and testing out price points. Are you better as a directional trader? Are you better as a counter trend trader? Are you better as a sideways uh, range trader and say strangles and straddles? Are you better with directional puts and calls? Are you better with the iron condors and butterflies or jade lizards or whatever you do, be a fan of testing and experimentation. Okay. So, there's a lot of data, and this is usually overwhelming. I used to be a statistician for the Ford Motor Company, and that's the truth. I was an also certified quality engineer. I was internationally published in the total quality management, quality improvement industry back in the late 80s, early 90s through ASQC, and I'm a CQE and all that. So I'm a metrics and numbers guy, a hardcore numbers guy. So I love data. I love data tables, but they kind of make most people's eyes glaze over. You know, you want to look at things like whether using – uh, I like the idea, and it's neat to hear that uh, Larry's also a fan of using modified B bands. I was talking with Larry Bollinger at the Money Show of Vegas last year, uh, and I was, and he explained to me uh, exactly how he developed Bollinger bands. Because I asked him, and I, was, I you got to tell me, this uh, one math guy to another, tell me how you came up with it. And he explained the process that he originated B bands with. You need to be thinking about process variability and process variation and outlier data points. And that's why I like learning from guys like Larry McMillan, too, because, you know, he talks about things like put call ratios and numbers where you're stretching the extreme and then that gives you a reversal signal. Or if you're in an in-trend directional play, how long does it last before it's overbought or oversold? And how do you make a option strategy that serves you well as an active trader? So, you know, this looks like a, a butt ugly sell off chart at support at 170. Who knows whether it's going to keep dropping or pivot. Odds are, you know, if I were laying odds, I'd give it 60% continuation down, 40% pivot. Uh, but it's one of those heavily talked about in the financial media fang stocks. And what you want to do if you're looking at how many contracts to trade, also do a split, a split test strategy, you know, where you may be doing 
a weekly options, but maybe you're doing the one week and the two weeks out, right? Whether you're doing the 14th and the 21st puts, or you're doing a, a straddle or a strangle, and you're looking at doing a little sum of both or, you know, both sides of the fence, you, first of all, find, test out, I guess, on paper, uh, what you're most consistent at. That's one thing that I found really helped me develop my own option strategy is figuring out, you know, at what strikes, you know, am I better close to in the money, at the money, out of the money? It depends on the chart, depends on the previous historical volatility. You know, avoid rookie mistakes too, like buying your options right ahead of earnings release, just like holding the underlying. That's gambling. You don't want to do that because gaps can go either way. I, I've heard precious, like almost nobody, talk about the impact of gaps on earnings plays. And yet gaps are trading the underlying. That's our favorite pattern is gap continuations. Uh, you want to be able to manage your options exit strategy correctly if things uh, gap against you and you know, and, and also correctly take profit if things go your way. So do have a strategy and don't hold an earnings release. Another thing you need to do, which I know it's, it's a challenge, but like the late great Jim Rohn once said, the only place success comes before work is the dictionary. Everyone else, we got to grind and hustle and roll up our sleeves and do the hard work that makes it easier. Most traders are not willing to do the hard, intelligent work to make things easy. But, you know, like Larry shows a very intelligent approach. He's a very smart guy. And I, I love the bath. It's so smart looking at things like the, the put call ratio and looking at oscillators and looking at signals, basically. That's what it, what I what I picked up is uh, what he teaches is a lot of things that give you directional signal that help provide a foundation for decision making and your trade setups. And that's important that you make that part of your own personal trading approach. For example, you need to better understand implied volatility using the historical volatility to forecast price action and recognize an increase or a spike in implied volatility in IV by knowing which breakout patterns move price the best and how, how far they're most likely to continue so you can pick the right strike price. So, for example, you know, on this guy, we ran 232 down to 170. If we kind of zoom in on a 90 day daily candlestick chart, I love the leverage of options. What I don't like is time decay, but hey, welcome to the club. I'm a very short-term time guy anyway. Most of my trades are day trades, so I'm good with that. One quick tip is to use 50% price projection. So the range on this guy is 232 to 172. So that's roughly 60 sticks or 60 points. So the support on this might be around 140. Resistance might be, well, actually I would, go a little bit earlier than the 200, which would be there. But anyway, the, the use about half of the trading range, kind of bisect it and use that as a price projection for the exit, for where it's best case likely to go. And that helps you determine which strike is most likely to hit uh, in time for you to make a profit in your options trade. And the same thing is true for directional pivots. You can see the range here, 230 to 170. You cut that in two, that's roughly 30 points is half of that. So off the base, the exit target would be 200 or so. So if you set up a strike, uh, you know, for buying a call or whatever you're doing, uh, you want to put that, give it, it would take this much time, best case, to travel that many points. And if you're doing a weekly option, there's no way you're going to get that much. You're gonna, you might get 192, best case, more likely 178, 182 or something on a weekly, you know, or 164, 165 on the strike on, on a put on the sell. So whatever you're trying to do as a trader, make sure that you're, you're, uh, you're making sense out of it. Well, thanks, Jim, saying I can't wait for you to start trading options. I've been trading options. I just haven't been public with it uh, for years now. I'm testing out how to say I'm an expert in volatility and breakouts. That's that's what I do. Uh, that's who I am. I'm the breakout guy and the breakout trader. And so I'm looking, you know, if you're trading, start your life off as an options trader by trading things with the most consistent breakout trends possible. Like I had been telling everyone about Square, SQ, uh, a while back, NVIDIA before that, Disney before that. Those are charts with monster trends where you could have done extremely well until they stop. Here's another quick tip. And I told everyone to get out of Square at the exact top and use this as part of your decision-making process when you're trying to find out which strikes make sense. Always look for exit targets. And I published this in Stocks and Commodities Magazine. But look for exit targets near obvious things with nines, like 90 to 100. The 100 was obvious resistance in square, right? 
Whenever you pull up charts, look for resistance at places where everyone else is going to and look for support you know, at places like 200 SMAs. The first time something touches down at a 200 SMA, that's usually a good pivot signal. And the reason is because you hear all these people fussing foolishly at the uh, quant trades and algorithmic trading. Of course, they weren't blanking and moaning when the market was rallying, right? But as soon as things start to sell, it's, oh, it's the machines. It's like the Terminator. They're out to get us. The machines are out there. Yeah, well, I don't think so. It's uh, You're your own best friend or your own worst enemy as a trader. Speaking from experience, my biggest, my two biggest failures as a trader, one is I don't trade large enough size, and the other is that I tend to overtrade in terms of the number of instruments. But I'd rather overtrade and take tight stops on the ones that don't work out than undertrade and try and take you know big shots at markets and have things stop me out. So, you know, whether you're looking for directional, directional plays or counter trend bounces. Do have a strategy in place uh, when it comes to trading your options that makes sense for you. So that's kind of all I had. That's me. I wanted to give you folks a, again, you can look at my Twitter feed. I only have a few thousand followers, but I'm a real money trader who's actually made money. I don't know, like yesterday, right? Well, I should say day before yesterday. That's what the TVIX chart looked like, by the way, when I was trading. And I sold 45 and a quarter. Now that's, I've been day trading since 1999. That's one of the most exciting charts I've seen in my life. I get excited looking at these kind of charts. Back in my 20s, I used to get excited looking at beautiful women. Now having been happily married for 20 years, celebrating my 20th anniversary this past month, yay, I get excited making lots of money and charts with lots of directional volatility, right? This guy, look at this range, 36 to 46, almost 46, and I sold 45 and a quarter. That was one of the most exciting moments in my life as an active trader, selling what turned out to be pretty much the exact top for a nice thousand dollar plus profit. And you know that kind of opportunity is there, whether you're a stock day trader or you're trading directional options plays with sensible strategies. Uh, you've got to put together a testing process where you're constantly, part of your life as a trader should always be testing and experimentation for anything you do in your life, right? I play tenor sax and keyboards too. So bonus, you can hear me play tenor sax. But anyway, kind of a, and I also play pivots, not just breakouts. Good example of one was Twitter today. TWTR. I bought Twitter off the low here. I sold maybe a little too soon up here at 32.20, but I bought the 31. It was either 31.30 or 31.50. I was long on the pivot. I think it was the 30. Anyway, I bought here and I sold there. And it, kind of a parting thought, when you're looking for directional trades or you're looking for, in this case, a counter trend trade, do look for previous resistance or at least congestion as an exit target. And that was a smart place to exit the trade because it could have gone right back down again. So I'm fine trading it within this window. If you are trading pivots, make sure you're trading extremes. And if you're trading breakouts, make sure like with TVIX or these other things that I trade, like the VXX or SDS or QID. Jobs report's coming out tomorrow morning. It'll be interesting. I went long uh, in TVIX and a few of the other inverses. I was buying into the drop here. We'll see if that was ill-advised or not. If the jobs report is responded to favorably, I'll be in deep kimchi and this guy will drop down to like 38 or 40. But if the jobs report comes out negatively, I'll be a happy camper. It'll gap up to 53, 54. Either way, I'm ready for it. And I hope that I, I've given you folks some food for thought as well. Let me leave you with a parting thought here. You're welcome to join me for my free webinars. I've also put together a new free part of my website. We're going to be doing some server maintenance work later tonight. I think it's 10 o'clock Eastern, they said. So that's in a few hours. So my server will be offline for a couple hours later tonight. I have so many new subscribers and so much new business. I've been upgrading my server farm to accommodate because my website's started to load a little slow. But anyway, you're welcome to go to that place, trademastery.com forward slash TM register. Or if you go to 
my site at Trade Mastery. You can click here, the start with the click. You can also get free webinars coming up uh, once a month, the first Saturday of each month by clicking either of these places. And of course, I have other educational resources as well. So anyway, I'm Ken Calhoun. I want to thank all of you so much for being here. And I hope that my introduction to some of the sensible options chain I'm going to watch for more YouTube videos. My YouTube channel has over 10,000 subscribers. Yay. It's Trading Television is my YouTube channel. Or just search my name on YouTube, Ken Calhoun. Anyway, we're going to be looking more at directional and counter trend and sideways uh, options trading strategies. And the most important decisions to get right are, number one, strong charts. The problem a lot of traders have is they overtrade choppy charts. And that includes options trades. And you guys get stopped out and get frustrated. So stop the madness. There's got to be a better way. Strong directional trend, high volatility, uh, strong charts are number one. Number two is diversify and play the field. Maybe a couple of contracts max per position. Uh, don't be doing six and eight and 10 and 12 contracts per trade. Uh, figure out if you're better as, say, a, a daily or weekly or two-week options trader by testing. And how far in or out of the money you tend to do and how, how does that work out in terms of are you playing the most popular or maybe the second most popular but more profitable instrument anyway that's me I want to thank you all so much for being here and thanks to my colleague larry mcmillan world's top options expert and hope that you guys get out there and uh, do well in the markets we've got lots of volatility so that's certainly more interesting than the sideways market so take care and i'll see you guys next time and thanks larry for being here too